All right. All right. All right. So this is JJ Pianchi at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign interviewing Eric Bosher on July 14th, 2017 in the University Library, Main Library. Where and when were you born? I was born June 6th, 1969 in Moline, Illinois at Moline Public, which has since been taken down. Oh. <laughs> Who are or were your parents and what are or were their occupations? Um, so my parent, my father is Earl Daniel Mosher, and he is currently retired. He is a retired journeyman sheet metal worker, uh, still in the union. Wow. My mother is uh, Patricia Osberg, and she is retired, and she worked for a company called Textron, and she sold screws. She was the screw queen. Those are her words, not mine. <laughs> Go, Mom. <laughs> do you have any siblings? Who were they, and did they serve in the military? Yes, I have two older brothers. Um, it's sketchy on the oldest one. He signed up for the Air Force. Two weeks later, came home. Um, my other brother, he did eight years in the U.S. Navy. Um, what were you doing before you entered the service? Before I entered the service, I was in high school. Doing the high school thing. That's it. Awesome. What branch of the military did you serve in? United States Navy. Okay. Uh, why did you choose that branch of the service? Um, tradition. Uh, my father was Navy. My grandfather was Navy. My uncle was Navy. My oldest brother was Navy. Uh, and the list kind of went on. So that's just kind of what we did. And for a white trash kid on the west end of Rockford, Illinois, it was an option out of Rockford, Illinois. Okay. What happened when you departed for training camp and during your early days of training? Um, so I left Rockford and I joined the U.S. Navy because I was sick of being in the Midwest. I was sick of being trapped in Rockford. So I went to uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. <laughs> and I thought, that's okay. Everybody goes here. Uh, so I went, I did boot camp there, uh, and then I left for my first school at an Air Force base in Rantoul, <laughs> Illinois. And I'm like, okay, time out. I'm trying to get out of Illinois. So I did my boot camp training in uh, Waukegan, Illinois at Great Lakes, and then I did my first school for weather and oceanography and tactical environment at uh, Rantoul Air Force Base, or Chanute Air Force Base, Rantoul, Illinois. And so when I finished that and orders came up, uh, I picked the first ship out of Dodge and went to San Diego. <laughs> um, so during boot camp, do you recall your instructors? And if so, what were they like? Yes, I do. Those are people you don't forget. Uh, <laughs> Senior Chief Co. and Chief Skipworth. Don't call him Skippy. Uh, what were they like? They were like, um, they weren't good cop, bad cop, but one was a little more aggressive than the other. One was a little more uh, teaching oriented, and the other was a little more discipline oriented. And Senior Chief uh, Co. was very teaching oriented. Chief Skipworth was a little more disciplinarian. Awesome. I remember that very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you receive any specialized training, and if so, in what? Uh, so I did, it was kind of like, um, I, looking back now as an adult, uh, I have a different perspective than as an 18 year old kid. I may have been a little gullible, uh, as an 18 year old <laughs> kid. They kept saying, oh, you're smart. You should do this weather. And, you know, weather is one of the upper mental groups, you know, it's like, um, nuclear propulsion and then air traffic controller and then weather is like the upper mental group. And so it's very flattering about you're smart enough, go do this. And then I did very well uh, in those, in that school. And they said, oh, you should do operational oceanography. And I said, well, what's that about? And they said, we can't really tell you until you get your security clearance. I said, okay. And so I did my security clearance. And I did operational oceanography. I did pretty well there. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, you did pretty good here. You should learn tactical environment support system. And I said, what's that? And they go, well, we can't really tell you until we, and I said, okay. So I said, you know, did that. <laughs> and uh, so basically it was a computer that took a lot of environmental data and told 
how, and it's D-class now, radar, laser, you know, mm -hmm. how all that stuff acts in the atmosphere. And I did pretty well there, and then they said, oh, you know, we see you're going to the pig. That's what, uh, so an amphibious assault ship carries Marines. Mm -hmm. Marines kind of grunt a lot, <laughs> so you can't have a grunt without a pig. So <laughs> LPH-11 carried Marines. That was his job, it's amphibious assault. So we called it the pig. Um, so you go into the pig. So we want to make sure that you're ready for forward deployment. I'm like, what's that? So oh, you just support the forward spotting officer, no big deal. I said, okay. I'll do that. And so uh, I spent a lot of time at Camp Pendleton at search, evasion, and rescue, uh, close combat. And uh, I remember being in the middle of it. I was 18 and a half years old saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I picked weather because it sounded safe. <laughs> and I had gone probably to the other end of the spectrum of safe. So they told me I'd sit in an air-conditioned office and make weather maps. That's what they told me. And I was carrying a 60-pound backpack through the desert with Marines who otherwise don't really care for people in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eric. Yeah, it gets better. Do, do I want to know how so? Yeah, I'm sure we'll get to it. <laughs> okay. Um, how did you adapt to military life, including the physical regimen, barracks, food, and social life? Um, I had an idea... Not a great idea, but I had an idea because my oldest brother had done boot camp the year before I did. He was only a year older than me. And so I had an idea going in what it, what it would be like. And the key is shut up, right? <laughs> and so everybody wants to be the honor recruit of their company. Everybody's going to show that, you know, I'm the best in this group. And I, no, shut up. <laughs> and uh, so the people who tried to stand out ultimately would make a mistake and then just draw undue attention upon themselves. And so you learn quickly, and my brother had told me, listen, when you get there, just don't talk. Nobody knows your name. You're just there for the two months to get through. You know, do what they ask, when they ask, and, and don't F it up, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had an idea. So how I adapted was uh, I'm generally very vocal, but I spent two months just not talking. Uh, I would talk to my bunkmate. I talked to people around me, obviously, but... Anytime we were in um, like a situation where you know the instructors were giving, just don't talk. You weren't going to be the honor recruit. You weren't going to be the standout that they you know promoted for all this stuff. And so that's how I adapted. Is just just observe, make sure I was following instruction, which I'm sure is what they wanted anyway. They wanted compliant individuals, and so mm -hmm. that's how I how I adapted. How I adapted to the food. That took about two weeks uh, and many, many trips to the restroom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, where were you stationed? So, uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Center, uh, Chinute Air Force Base, and then the USS New Orleans, LPH-11. They sunk it in 2010. I refused to watch the video. Uh, part of SyncX, they said, oh, we no longer need this ship. They towed it out there and sunk it. They're jerks. Uh, and then I was also at the Naval Pacific Meteorology and Oceanography Center, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And part of that was Joint Typhoon Warning Center. Oh, cool. And then I was TDY to an Army vessel that went to Somalia. I was uh, TDY and set up um, the, most, the most northern uh, weather uh, in Iraq. So, so kind of been around the block. Also, I spent a lot of time with the 13th and 15th Marine Expeditionary Units in the southern Philippine Islands and Indonesia. That may or may not still be classified, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay. I don't think you've revealed anything classified okay, good, so far. Good, good, um, good. If you went abroad, what were some of your experiences? Uh, of your experiences? Yeah, right. So the... USS New Orleans, we were the assault ready group for the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. So our job was to sit off the coast and make sure nobody tried to make a point during the Olympics. Well, it was a six month deployment, so we didn't just go to Korea. We went to Japan, um, Honshu Island, also Okinawa. Um, we went to Thailand. We went to um, Australia. 
we, we went everywhere, Mombasa, Kenya, uh, and the, the ship hit everything in the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean. And uh, um, we would stay, the longest we stayed place was uh, Philippines, we were there 39 days one time and then like nine days another time. Uh, otherwise we'd be four to seven days uh, in port, usually for what's called Liberty Call, where we just kind of went out and spent all of our money. Yeah. How was that? Was that good? Yeah, it's kind of a blur. <laughs> I guess I have a tattoo to show for it. That's about it. Yeah, it's uh, you're on the ship with you know just a bunch of people that may or may not be sick of hanging around uh, for a couple of weeks, and then you get to pull in somewhere and go on liberty, and maybe you get in trouble, maybe you don't. Standard sailor stuff. All the stories you've heard are probably true. <laughs> Okay. What about some other places you went? Um, yeah, so just the Western Pacific. Uh, oh, we made it to Seattle for the Seattle Sea Fest in 89. We went down to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, because they had a fire that literally burnt their town to the ground. So we provided assistance. We went and brought aid. And, you know, so, you know, it wasn't all just drink all their beer that we tried. <laughs> uh, um, Mazatlan, Mexico, um, Hawaii, a couple times. We were in the Gulf of Alaska, uh, but we didn't. We were going to pull into Kodiak, but then we decided it's too cold, and so we left and went to Okinawa instead. Um, Just so, like yeah, that. so anything, anything west of San Diego, uh, but not past Africa, is. Uh, pretty much touched it all. So all in the Pacific, not in the Atlantic. Yeah, I have I don't think Europe is a continent. Everybody talks about it, but I've <laughs> never personally seen it. So but okay. I can tell you about Asia. <laughs> <laughs> so you also mentioned that you were stationed at some point like in Somalia. Yeah. So, so was that super on the boat short. Or? Yeah. So how that worked is think there's a thing called T D Y, temporary duty assignment. I don't know what the Y stands for, but temporarily assigned to something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I worked in weather, obviously. I've, maybe I mentioned that. But um, something people don't know is the U.S. Army has ships. They're not big, but they have them. They're called vessels. So there's the named... Navy has the, ships the Navy has ships. The, the Army has ships. ships. They're called Army vessels, so, AV, okay. right? And so AV named after somebody who probably died in a battle. And uh, I rode, um, they carried tanks around. It's, you can fit tanks in the back of C-130s. Okay. It's really expensive. You burn all of the fuel, okay? So when we very first were helping out, I don't know how much help we did in Somalia, we flew a couple tanks over, but then the rest came over via garbage scow, which are these army vessels. And so they have very specific constraints. So if the waves are too high or the wind's too high, they will sink, which is a pretty poor design for something that goes out in the ocean. So I rode this army vessel over and I was the weather asset. And we pulled in, uh, we didn't turn the motors off. We docked and uh, uncraned, craned off the tanks and we were interacting with uh, our peer liaison and one day he wasn't there and the next day he wasn't there and then there was a different peer liaison and we're like oh hey where's this other guy and they're like yeah well uh, he's dead as happens in a country that's having a civil war uh, regardless if you think it's an authentic civil war I happen to think it wasn't an authentic civil war I think it was a like an active attempt at de destabilizing the region but I, I don't want to get all smedley butler on you at this point so uh, <laughs> okay. Don't, nobody has to put on tinfoil hats. So, yeah, so Somalia, uh, how much of that country I saw was the pier. Uh, I was terrified and I wasn't going to leave the boat. Um, we didn't turn off the motor and we had people standing at the mooring lines or how you tie up the mm -hmm. boat with axes so that if we had to leave, we were just going to cut the lines and go. So that was, uh, that was Somalia. Um, and so you were on the ship going to Somalia to make sure it didn't sink. Yes, that was my job. Make sure that it did not, what's called, exceed constraints. So if the waves over the front are too big or the waves over the back are too big or the wind's too strong, you know, it's kind of top heavy-ish. It's very shallow draft. Um, that, that was my job. Cool. There. 
Um, so you also mentioned setting up the northernmost weather station. Yeah, that. So you know, let's not be too vocal about that. A uh, mm -hmm. lot of so how. Um, the Persian Gulf War went down, and again, I don't want to say we destabilized the reason the region to force them to buy uh, new drilling equipment from us because that's kind of tinfoil hat ish. But maybe that's what we were doing. Uh, how it worked was it looked like it was a um, it was a very army intense uh, operation. What we did is we massed up the navy uh, in the Persian Gulf along and. Uh, the Iraqis responded by moving all of their troops towards the coast, thinking it was going to be an amphibious assault. Okay. We then rolled in over the backside, coming from the south with the U.S. Army moving as quickly as they can in very light vehicles. Uh, and so it was basically jab with the right and then just come around with a left hook. And it was wildly effective. What people don't know is that we also went in through Turkey. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so Turkey is still technically Asia. Um, but we uh, came in south uh, from Turkey, and it was called Saddam's back door. We didn't want uh, any of the Iraqis retreating out that way. So we promised Turkey a pile of money and some other aid for use of their bases and to cross their border. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I went into Turkey with a Ford spotting officer in the Navy. They call him bombardment. It could be offshore bombardment from traditional cannons and guns on ships mm -hmm. to just calling an aircraft so they direct the aircraft to the target mm -hmm. and uh, I wasn't supposed to go it wasn't my thing but the people who were supposed to go weren't ready so I just went real quick we scurried across I set up the weather office uh, including all the computing equipment and other tactical environment gear and then uh, 10 days after that my replacement came and out you went and then I left and about two months after that, that weather office wasn't there anymore. Okay. So I got to duck that. So. Got lucky. Yeah, luck. That's what we call it. <clears throat> Any other experiences while you were abroad that stand out in your mind? Um, Good or bad? Yeah. So it was, it was weird because in the middle of... Uh, the Western Pacific deployment, uh, it, everything was, so everything's like a toggle switch. Like we, uh, in 88, uh, Indonesia wanted to uh, increase tariffs on using what's called the Lombok Straits. It's a waterway that shipping can go through. And so they, they said, hey, we're gonna charge more. And we said, don't, don't do that. And so they shut down the straits to shipping. The ships have to go around, they're gonna burn a lot more fuel and it's gonna cost a lot. Well, that happens to be their waterway, right? So the U.S. goes, open up the straits. And they said, no. We said, do it. And they said, make us. And we said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we threatened them physically by putting Marines on Lombok and Bali uh, to keep the straits open. Now, it's not our waterway. It's their waterway. And we're, you know, looking back now, and we're kind of jerks about it. Then it's like, oh, yeah, they do what we say, you know. And so there's that, which was pretty intense, right? We thought for sure it was going to escalate. Luckily, it did not. And then, like eight days later, we pull into Perth, Fremantle, Western Australia, and it's just a rolling party from the minute we get there till the minute we leave. And so, you know, you had to live like this toggle switch of like, whoa, shit's hitting the fan too. Okay, now we're just going to party and that... You know, so uh, what sticks out in my mind from those other events are like uh, generally when we pulled into places, people were actually glad to see us, which, you know, uh, my father being uh, Korean era and, you know, not, and uh, very, very early Vietnam era, military wasn't very popular, right? So when they pulled in places, people weren't that excited to see them tolerated them because you spent money, but not necessarily excited to see them. Mm -hmm. By the time the 80s rolled around, uh, then people were actually kind of excited to see us. So when we got to Australia, there was like a big party on the pier and the community came out to tour our boats and stuff. So, uh, so that's what I remember, generally going places and, and being surprised that people are like excited to see us. Mm -hmm. And this was all while you were on the New Orleans? Yeah, it's all on the, all on the New Orleans, yeah. <clears throat> 
If you were on the front lines, what combat action did you witness? Uh, so, uh, setting up in uh, Iraq, I didn't actually, we hardly saw any other people. Uh, we were, uh, we did negotiate with the Kurds to move through their space. Uh, otherwise, I didn't see anything. I mean, it was desert. And it was actually high desert, so it was very shrubby. Lots of sh lots, so a lot of people are used to seeing pictures of Iraq, and it's like just sand, right? Mm -hmm. I never saw that part. I was in the northern part where they actually got a little bit of rain because I worked in weather, so I knew it rained. <laughs> so it was all like shrubland. It was like going to like Colorado or something. That's kind of what it reminded me of. Uh, didn't see any other person other than Marines and Navy personnel there. Uh, Lombok Island, Indonesia, we exchanged hot rounds with the Moral Islamic Liberation Front, and uh, we don't like to leave a lot of evidence, so we just zipped them up in bags and retrieved them with us, which is uh, you know, at the time, like I said, I was like a 19-year-old kid, and I thought, that's what you do, looking back as, as an adult, now you're like, God, we might have been jerks about that, you know, and probably even more than just being jerks. We're probably behaving inappropriately on a global scale. Okay. So the parts of your job that weren't on the front lines, what were yeah. your duties like? So, yeah, daily routine, I was a weather dork, essentially. Uh, I went outside every 45 minutes and took a weather observation and then recorded it and then we transmitted it. Other people gathered everybody's weather observations and we made weather charts and maps and we did what's called Raywinson. So we would like get the atmospheric data with balloons, literally. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like you hear the jokes about, it's a weather balloon. We had them, <laughs> we set them up and we collected that data and uh, we put all that together because uh, Weather, in my personal opinion, having worked in weather, is probably the most important piece you need before you engage in anything, mm -hmm. right? Are you gonna grill out in your backyard? <laughs> is it raining? <laughs> You're probably not gonna grill out, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing, uh, are you gonna launch 400 Marines? And if the wind is too strong, the helicopters aren't going to tolerate that well. So. Maybe you wait for the wind to die down, and then so weather's pretty important. So that that's what I did. I collected and disseminated meteorological, oceanographic, and other tactical environment information to the fleet. Okay. <clears throat> if you saw combat, how did you feel when witnessing casualties and destruction? So that's another part of uh, light general PTSD. Is that with perspective, you look back and there's like actual shame associated with it. At the time, uh, I will be honest with you, at the time you are 10 feet tall and you're made out of steel and fuck those guys. And uh, so yeah, I carried an M14, I have a metal that shows I know how to use it correctly, <laughs> such that I can put holes in paper targets enough to earn uh, a shooting ribbon. and. Um, so the first time you just squeeze and it makes a loud noise and you have no idea what just happened. But as you settle in and you rely on your training and you kind of remember how things are supposed to go, you, you kind of get in the flow. And, uh, you know, and at the time, you, you know, you're doing it and there's a, a lot of adrenaline. You can't hear anything. You know, everything you see is muffled um, but you're, you're sharp at the time. Um, so yeah, it was 18 and a half minutes. Uh, we know that because of what time we called in to the ship. Cause uh, so I was four deployed, went in with the Ford spotting officer and six Marines, two of them, uh, were the Marines that set up the beach to make sure that the landing craft comes in safely. I did uh, surf height, uh, surge, swell, all of that tidal data because we still, I don't know whose idea this is, we have watercraft that if a wave breaks over the back of it, it sinks. That is a terrible design. So I existed to make sure that those boats didn't sink. You know, So surf height, surging, spilling, plunging, all this 
is important to our craft, right? That's the reason I was there. And then to give atmospheric data to transmit back to the ship so that they could, you know, intelligently load the missiles. And, and uh, so the atmosphere changes density. Obviously, you shoot a big, heavy round through the air. It will bend and uh, based on the density of the atmosphere. And so we had to uh, account for that. All that data gets sent back to the ship. So, and the best way to know what's happening at target is to actually collect data at target. And that's what I did. And so, yeah, we had a radio man, the Ford spotting officer, myself, uh, a couple other Marines, and uh, we had just radioed in. I had a little computer that had acid lead batteries. It was actually very heavy, um, and it was old, and it was like, you know, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk. it was like using teletype, you know, to use this computer. And I had like four lines that gave me information, so, you know, it's mm -hmm. super cryptic. Uh, but we did the atmospheric data, we did the search, and I sent all that back, and uh, we got the signal from the ship saying, yeah, you know, uh, we, got, we got the info, good to go. And I unplugged from the radio men, had a port that I would plug my computer into, and the forward spotting officer was talking on the radio back to the ship, and there was one guy there, this is 1988, one Marine gunnery sergeant there in charge of the Marines whose job it was to take care of the forward spotting officer. Not me, the forward spotting officer, right? Mm -hmm. um, he was the only person, uh, he was getting pretty old. Uh, he had actually been in, honest God, no shit, Vietnam. And so he's running down the beach at us, screaming, get down. And we're all like, what? what? And you hear, you hear like the snapping noise. We're like, is that an insect? What makes that kind of noise? He's like, dumbasses, get down. We're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so you try and get as flat as you can. And then, you know, go, gosh, why is my butt so big? Because that's what's going to get hit, right? Uh, it's weird what you think about. Um, and so the forward spotting officer was like, yeah, uh, we're probably getting shot at. And so we know from the time he radioed that back to the time that they said you got greenlit out to leave, uh, they sent a, a Huey to come pick us up, was about 18 and a half minutes. And in 18 and a half minutes, you go from terrified to, you know, I need more ammo. Let's go, you know. So and and so at the time, you you are you're almost indestructible at the time. Very shortly after that, like the helicopter ride back to the ship, it all kind of ebbs a little bit, and then you're like, wow, that was really sketchy. And so, and then as an adult, you get to kind of play it out a little bit and be like, ah, maybe we were jerks about that. <clears throat> what kinds of friendships and camaraderie did you form while serving, and with whom? Um, so, growing up, I had two older brothers. Um, I didn't really like them. They were physically abusive. Uh, and that's one thing about the military. The military is very good about taking, like, broken children and utilizing them until they're even more broken, I guess. I don't want to get too tinfoil hat there. Uh, but, and so when people talk about, oh, brothers, you know, like a brother relationship, I thought, yeah, my brothers are jerks, you know, I don't really like them. But then when I got in the military, you work with people uh, who are you know, like-minded, like-situationed, and people you could actually, like, no shit count on. And so, like, that's when I understood what it meant to have, like, a, like a brother. Um, I liked, uh, so I grew up on the west end of Rockford and went to high school with a lot of black people. That didn't really, you know, so I'd been exposed to black people. It's not, it's not like, oh, I had a thing where, like, I, I met a lot of kids from, like, the south who were then integrated, even in the 80s, you know, in the military. And they're like, God, all these black people. It's like, well, what's the big deal, you know? For them, that was probably their biggest adjustment. Uh, so two of my closest friends, you know, happened to be black guys. And... Uh, And it's just, you know, people who are like-minded like you, doing the same thing you're doing. And so, having gone from, you know, relationship with people who were peers, my brothers, who were jerks, you know, to people who were not, you know, it's like, oh, okay, now I get it. This is, this is what it's like to have a brother. 
Uh, unfortunately, in the military, everything's temporary. Either they're moving or you're moving. So you have to you have to form your relationships quickly, and then you have to be able to abandon it uh, because you know it's temporary. And did you keep in touch with any of them? Um, you do, and then you know your life takes over. So yeah. So yes, now uh, through the magic of Facebook, <laughs> I do keep in touch with. Uh, more than a couple. Now, like anything else, people who I was very close with 25 years ago, they've lived their life and I've lived my life. And at the time, we were like-minded. Now, maybe not so much. It's like, okay, well, nice chatting with you. Goodbye, because I don't need to see your racist rant on Facebook. Not something I'm interested in, right? Mm -hmm. They've lived their life. I live mine. The people who are, and I don't like, I, don't, I hate being political, but people who are politically aligned generally are the people I am still friends with on, on Facebook, um, stuff like that. But I do have uh, more than a couple of friends uh, on Facebook. I've reconnected with most of the people uh, through the magic of the Internet, uh, but many of them I've just decided, like, okay, well, thanks for the good times and cheers, good luck. You know, so. How did you stay in touch with family and friends back home while you were on the yeah. New Orleans and yeah. going about... Right, I'm kind of envious of people now because they, you know, they can send emails from the ship. You know, they get videos from the ship. Yeah, we didn't get that in the '80s. You actually had to sit down like some kind of heathen with a pen <laughs> and write. Come on, what kind of crap is that? Or you pulled into port and you got to make a very expensive long-distance collect call at what is essentially 4 o'clock in the morning, their time, to say hi to your mom. Hey, we're in Australia, 40 bucks. All right, hope you liked it, because that's <laughs> not cheap, right? So, so how do we stay in touch? We actually had to write, and I didn't do a lot of writing. Uh, quick caveat, because of that, um, on the ship, mail didn't come regularly. It only came when we could get it. So mail call was actually kind of a big deal. You'd get a stack of stuff that had been piling up for three, four, five weeks, right? And so mail call was actually kind of a big deal. You got stuff. And, you know, you got a letter from your mom. You got a letter from this girl that you thought you kind of liked, but it turns out you didn't really like her, but whatever. It's another letter. So, you know. Um, so, yeah. And a caveat of that is at my house, even now at 48 years old, nobody gets to get the mail. I get the mail. <laughs> when I get home, I get to open the mailbox. <laughs> I get to pull the stuff out and go, Bill, yay, because mail call was actually kind of a big deal. Right. And so that's something that's kind of stuck with me, even as an adult. It's like, the mail's here. The, you know, you're like you're like that movie, The Jerk, where like he finds his name in the phone book. I am somebody. I was like, oh, the mail's here. Yeah. So that, that's it. We had to write letters. We actually had to write letters. Awesome. <laughs> what did you do for recreation or when you were off duty? Uh, so on the ship, uh, we had a little weight room that we could go to. Otherwise, we played cards. We had closed-circuit TV. Uh, we'd watch the same three movies because, again, there was no digital download. It was all on VHS tape, and we'd hope to God we'd come in contact with another ship. And it's like, what have you got? Do you want to trade? Uh, so that's what we did on the ship. And the thing is, at sea... Uh, on the ship, you're busy a lot. I mean, uh, the ocean is constantly kicking the shit out of your ship. So you're you're painting something, you're fixing something, you do a crap ton of plan maintenance. Uh, so you're busy a lot. You don't have a lot of downtime. The downtime you do have, you sleep. Um, we worked rotating watches, so your sleep was irregular anyway. Um, but otherwise, we'd play cards or just hang out and talk. Or um, there was people who would fish because you're in the middle of the ocean, right? So they would fish off the fantail if we weren't at flight ops because you can't have people on the fantail during flight ops. That's what we do. In port, uh, living in San Diego, um, I rode my bike. There was a lot to do on base. That's how I met my wife. She worked for Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. It was the civilians who made sure that we all had stuff to do when we weren't working. She actually ran a uh, child care facility up in one of the housing, the military housing she ran where the kids went during the day when the parents went to work. Uh, but she was working at a concert that the military was putting on. It was Kenny Loggins, Highway to the Danger Zone. Uh, 
you're welcome. <laughs> and uh, I met her there. So she worked for MWR. So there was this whole unit of people who made sure we had things to do. Uh, so uh, went swimming a lot, went to the beach a lot. Uh, when I lived in Hawaii, well, Jesus, it's Hawaii, you know. So we just did everything you could possibly do in Hawaii. Awesome. So you mentioned cards on, on ship. Yeah. What, uh, any particular games you're now good at? Um, so we played spades almost exclusively. Yeah, okay. and I'm not great at it, but by God, I will argue with you. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you were in the service, did you read for pleasure, and if so, what? Uh, I did. I did read, and my wife actually even now points that out. And then when she met me, I read. Uh, and now, <laughs> I work at a library. Why would I read? Uh, so then I would read, um, I read a lot of Stephen King. So I read The Stand, unabridged, on Westpac. That book was so long. Uh, you ain't no nice guy, so people who've read The Stand will know what that is. Um, so I read that. Uh, I read Bachman, which was Stephen King uh, again. Um, I read a lot of Clive Cussler before he kind of went overboard. So anything up to and including Pacific Vortex and Sahara was actually really good. Anything after that, I think it was Clive, uh, or I'm sorry, so Clive Cussler I still read. I want to. I want to be very clear about that. I, I may have overspoken there. Clive Cussler is still an excellent uh, writer. He does uh, historical fiction. He takes historical events and then writes fiction around it. It's actually really good stuff. So I read a lot of Clive Cussler. Um, there was another author, uh, and his name escapes me. And I work for a library. Isn't that ridiculous? I can't remember an author's name. You can shame me. Both of you shame me right now. No, we're not going to shame. Shame me because I can't remember. Anyway, he wrote some good stuff, but then I. Think and I will. I will email you this author's name. I promise. We got to get this in the documentation. Okay. He got to a point where he was writing about other people, and then he was just basically writing as if he were the most important person in the book in different situations. Right. That's how it occurred to me. He tried to buy the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, what is his name? Anyway, that guy. I used to read that up until he jumped the shark, and then I stopped. But anyway, Clive Cussler, uh, Stephen King uh, were the authors I read. Mm -hmm. Okay. What particular book would you say influenced your life the most and why? Book that influenced my life. Um, so, then or now, uh, I can think of a couple of books. One, um, the book that influenced my life the most probably is um, the Taub's, Gary Taub's, uh, Why You're Fat and What You Can Do About It, uh, where... He did not implicate the sugar industry for trying to actively kill me, but pretty much how it played out, right? And uh, understanding my own personal body chemistry. Uh, so after reading that book, I dropped close to 60 pounds and was able to ride my bike again and run again. My asthma is under control. Uh, blood pressure is perfect. So that one, probably. And I think I like it because it was just enough science. Uh, I have a geophysics background. Um, uh, thermodynamics was in there, you know, and and enough social explanation like, okay, so you don't need to know what an integral is, right? What you need to know is that this is a measurement of these things and here's how it plays out. So Gary Taub's book has probably influenced uh, me the most just in understanding my own personal body chemistry. Um, socially, um, I remember reading a book, and again, I worked for a library. <laughs> I'll get you the name of the book and the author that taught me to view money differently. Like money one is an object and a construct and two, it represents, it's the physical representation of the only thing you have which is time on this earth, right? And you exchange your time for money. You may have to do things in that time, but that's essentially what you're doing. You're, and so when you view something like, oh, I'm gonna buy a new car and you think $30,000, mm, I've got $30,000. That's one way to look at it. But if you look at it, like, that represents X number of years of my labor. Do I want to trade that much of my labor? For, so for it gives you a different perspective on things. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I got on top of that, um, you know, we, uh, my wife and I are nearly debt free. We owe $14,000 on our house and we will be paid off in the next two years and then we will be debt free. 
And so when I look at, and, and I did all of that without suffering, just changing my perspective on viewing it, it's the same money, it's my same effort, right? But because I changed my attitude and perspective on how it is spent, all the stuff that doesn't actually matter, I don't spend money on. And all the things that actually matter from my perspective, I've actually increased spending in certain areas. And people think, how do you save money? Don't spend any money. No, spend money, but only spend it on time, money, and energy is spent on things you want to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. So if you're spending money on McDonald's, you're saying, McDonald's exists in the world. I don't think McDonald's needs to exist in the world. They get zero of my dollars, right? Other people can give money, fine. I'm just not going to. So when I change my attitude about money, uh, I don't feel trapped by it. I, I'm almost out of debt, and you know, it's it's now a vehicle to achieve the things, in line with my priorities and attitudes, and uh, along with my wife. I'm not going to pretend like she doesn't make most of those decisions. <laughs> uh, but we're, but you know, but but she and I, you know, are on the same page, and so, and it doesn't mean we don't spend money. We do. We just spend it on things that are actually important to us. So there, those are the two books. Okay. Did you use libraries when you were in the service? Why or why not? I did. I did use libraries. Um, the ship had a library, mm -hmm. and that's where I first found Clive Cussler. Uh, and I'm like, hey, this is pretty good. And I just kind of wrote that out. So yeah, and, and I used it then because we didn't have the internets. Uh, and, and we didn't have personal DVD players and personal media players. If you wanted to watch what was on TV, you watched what was on the one TV where 70 people were sitting around it and you couldn't really hear it. So I did a lot more reading. Yeah. Was the ship's library for recreation only or was it recreation and, and research work stuff? Or? So the documentation for the things you needed to know were kept at the location where you did them. So the ship's library was 100% uh, recreation. Uh, where were you when conflict ended? Which conflict? When conflict ended? I don't, I don't know that question. Where I were suppose, you? I suppose the, the, the biggest conflict would have been Persian Gulf 1. Right. So when, when conflict ended, uh, the first Persian Gulf, I was in Hawaii. I was in Hawaii feeling guilty because we were going to the beach literally every day. Somebody had to, right? So it was going to be me. <laughs> okay. How long were you in the service? Seven years. Seven years. Okay. Um, A lot happens in seven years. Yes, it does. Like 70% of my life happened in those seven years. And the rest of my 41 years on the planet have constitute maybe 30% of my life. It's really dense when you're in the military. So can you unpack that a little bit more? What, when you say it's really dense, do you feel like... Like a lot so many happens. So many like, experiences. So Like just compounded uh, one on top of the other. Even when you're bored, there's a lot going on. Like the ship had a major fire that we had to put out that I was involved. I mean, you know, if I were to sit and go through every, you know, there's, the archive isn't going to hold all this, you know, uh, and not just me, everybody else. I mean, just, just the littlest things. We had Russian MiGs fly down our flight deck about 40 feet off our flight deck. And so we launched AH-1 uh, Whiskey Super Cobras with Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles strapped to them, and we locked onto them. And, you know, and that was pretty intense. And that whole evolution took maybe 17 minutes. But it's like, you know, to explain all, everything that happened in that, it's going to take two hours, you know. We, we were doing underway replenishment with the U.S. NS Navasota and a Russian troller, because this is before the fall of the Soviet Union. We were still going head to head. And we said it. We looked them in the eye. We said, any time. And we were with the Navasota, and you know we're 30 feet apart with lines across, and a troller splits us. So we have to like pull the lines back as fast as we can, but we left the JP-5, which is jet fuel, line over. When they went under, we dumped about 600 gallons of jet fuel on them. And you can see the paint peeling off the side of their ship, actually. We were pretty close to just lighting it up just then. So, so many times, you know, that uh, something happens, you know, and it's just 
minutes, but it's so dense. We had, I, and just simple stuff. You have to practice all the time. So we were loading Marines onto helicopters, and uh, one of the sailors whose job it was, called Combat Cargo, moved the Marines to the helicopters, uh, made a mistake, went to the wrong spot, and walked into a tail rotor. And yeah, mm -hmm. shit like that happens all the time. And so that's what I mean by it's dense. So even, you know, you, the whole 24 hour period, the entire day is boring and completely routine, except for this six minutes where this guy walks into a tail rotor and they have to clean that up and then, oop, okay, put him in the refrigerator because calls parents, you know. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it's really, really dense. A lot happens in a short amount of time. So that so that's the thing. It's like I sometimes it seems like it was just the other day. Cuz that's when everything happened. So and then you come back and you get a little pissed because you're out defending freedom and you see stupid people and it's like this is what you do with your freedom. Maybe it's wasted. Again, I don't want to get too tinfoil hat on you. Sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so when you returned home, um, how was that coming back home? How did you get home? So I got home on an airplane. Okay. It was awesome. Uh, I was <laughs> married. I had a baby. Oh. And that's why I got out because um, okay. I had just had my oldest son. And I was had gone from sea rotation to land rotation. There were some caveats in that land rotation. I did have to go take care of some things, other places. But for that last four years, for the most part, I was in Hawaii. I did have to go, you know, went to Somalia, uh, went, went to Iraq for a very short time. Um, uh, went, a couple of other things had to happen. Uh, but for the most part, I was in Hawaii. I just had a baby, so that was my land rotation. It was actually pretty cushy, all things considered, right? And so uh, the Master Chief, who's in charge of deciding where all the enlisted people go, I was like, you owe me some hard sea time, young man. And I went, nope. Packed it up and, and exited into obligated active service. I was married. I had a baby. I wasn't going back to sea. So I uh, went back to Illinois. Went to college on the Illinois State Veterans Grant. So the ISVG paid for my college. That's why I ended up back in Illinois. Um, just... Left the military. My wife, uh, when I met her, she had already finished college. So she was a certified teacher. So we got back here. She got a teaching job. I went to Parkland Junior College. Then I went to the University of Illinois. And that's how I got back. I, I got back based solely on the Illinois State Veterans Grant. And I actually use it in the military. Everybody's on the college program. Nobody goes to college. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, because nobody wanted to admit I had nothing else to do. And so uh, I actually executed the college program. So, okay. Where'd you get your degree in? Geophysics, December 98, University of Illinois. Went to work for Exxon and Exxon Mobil in Houston, Texas. And then I lived in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia for SO Production Malaysia. Every story you've heard about oil companies, they're true. Okay. So that's when I realized I had a conscience. Up until then, I was, I, I, uh, yeah, I'd done some stuff, obviously. And I thought, that's just what you do, right? And then when uh, I was working, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have to do this. I, we don't have to treat people terribly. Mm -hmm. And oil companies do. They really, really do. I was, and I was living in Malaysia, um, and raises came out. So all of the people who are from Malaysia working for SO Production Malaysia were talking about their pay. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think that's tacky, but I also, I'm knowledgeable enough to know that that's what people do. Mm -hmm. People do talk about their pay with their peers. Am I gonna, and, and they kept asking me, how much you get paid? I'm just going, no, don't worry about it, don't worry, don't worry about it. And the woman who was Oxford trained in England, Oxford trained, living in Malaysia, as working as the DBA, was taking home 100% of her pay less than my local draw, which meant I just took some money there because my apartment was paid for, my car was paid for, I got a 20% uplift in pay. I got home maintenance allotment because I kept my house in Texas. Right. And just the money I was taking locally to buy souvenirs and fart around with was more than we were paying an Oxford graduate. And uh, I had said something to uh, 
the HR director there, he happened to be from New Zealand. I said, gosh, you know, it's much money, $50 billion in three months. We can't pay these people better? He's like, look, they work for us. I'm like, hey, I'm not okay with that. And then, then they said, well, I don't think you get it. And what I know as an adult is anytime somebody tells me I don't get it, they don't like the fact that I actually get it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, maybe I don't play along. And they said, goodbye. And I said, goodbye. And because it, it took up until I was like 30-something years old to realize you don't have to do shitty stuff. You really don't. And so I parted ways with Exxon back, back then. So you, so you went from the Navy to eventually Exxon. College to Exxon to, to SO Production Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. How, how, just out of curiosity, how did you end up as a librarian? So uh, I work in IT. Mm -hmm. So I'm just an IT dork, so I'm not actually a librarian. Okay. Uh, I play one on TV. No, I, <laughs> I work in IT. Uh, I have a master's in management information systems. Okay. Uh, how, how? Here's why. I worked 15, so after leaving ExxonMobil, worked for a company called Amdocs. It's an Israeli company, and the people listening to this can get angry. I've made my choice. Maybe they're terrible people. Uh, and I worked in information security. I hid a lot of information for a long time. I work in a library. It is honestly like no shit, the last bastion, truly, of free speech. It doesn't exist anywhere else. It does not exist anywhere else. It does not exist in our media, which is just a circus for ratings. It doesn't exist in our government. It doesn't exist in private industry. The only place you can go to get access to actual research, actual literature, actual free speech is in a library, and I'm terrified they're going to come after us next. Okay. So that's why I work in a library, because I was tired of hiding stuff. My job now is to make things available through helping librarians, right? Uh, I'm in charge of the public image. People don't have to tell us anything. They can come and use our resources, and I think that's fantastic. Okay. That's why I work at a library. Cool. Because it's, it's literally the last place, the last place you can go without being accused of being a scoundrel. Okay. Um, so rewinding a little bit, when yeah. you got home from the yeah. service, yeah. Um, home being, I guess, Illinois, Right. Um, how were you received by family, friends, coming back? Yeah, so uh, my stepmom, so my oldest brother, when he, my older brother, uh, the middle one, when he got out, he moved in with my dad. And he was still kind of like hanging out there. And so my stepmom's like, this halfway house is closed. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, but uh, I had a little better planning than my brother. So my wife and I actually had money. Not a lot, but we could rent a house. You know, she worked. You know, it was real. Um, uh, when I got back, people were um, cliche is the word I want to use. It's so like my neighbor. You know, said, oh, I just got a Navy. Thank you for your service. I'm like, shut up, Mitch, you know, <laughs> because one, you don't know what I did. And if you did, you might not thank me. And two, it's disingenuous. Uh, so I was received cliche. People were willing to thank me. And then that was the end of it. That was it. Okay. And, and that's okay. Because I think if they honestly knew what I did, uh, they wouldn't thank me. All right. How did you readjust to civilian life? Uh, just grew my hair out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I stopped. I didn't shave. I didn't get haircuts. Uh, I was going up to the junior college uh, at Parkland. I was working at the Parkland College Library. I reshelved microfilm. Mm -hmm. That's probably where I was first introduced to library work. Um, and, uh, you know, I just did the things other people did. Um, there were veterans groups. Uh, I didn't join them. Uh, instead, I joined the, you know, the non-consequential things, the non-political things. I, I took German because uh, I had to have a language, and I took German in high school because my oldest brother took German, and I thought he'd help me, and he didn't. Uh, so I just took German. I joined, like, the German club, not because I thought, you know, German, the best way is whatever, mm -hmm. you know. It's just something to do that wasn't all these other things. And so I just, how I 
reasserted back into civilian culture was I just went to junior college. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you remained in contact with or reunited with fellow veterans, and if so, who? Uh, so I have two that I stay in contact with. Uh, they both worked weather, and they both worked in Hawaii. Uh, we are in the same uh, shift. Um, so one lives in Nebraska, and he is pretty conservative. Uh, and the other lives in California. He's pretty liberal. And uh, they tell types. Yeah, right. And so, uh, yeah, those are the two that I've actually kept in contact with. I've been in contact with a, a number of other people. And as close as we were, the relationships were temporary. Just like high school, everybody says, oh, I'll never forget you guys. And then you go back to your high school yearbook and somebody writes, oh, remember all those great times we had? No. And then they sign their name Colin. It's like, Colin? Who the hell's Colin? You know, same thing, right? People would contact me. Hey, remember we worked together in Hawaii? It's like, yeah, I don't give a shit about you. <laughs> so good luck. So, uh, but the internet has made it super easy. Uh, Facebook, I am on, uh, I have a private group that I'm in from the LPH-11. Uh, all the sailors and Marines who are stationed on the New Orleans posts up there. Um, sometimes it's weird, like, oh, look at this new gun I bought. Not interested. Uh, and sometimes it's political. Not interested. Sometimes it's like, hey, I found this picture of Westpac 93. Then it is interesting. Oh, look, I found this picture when we were tied up in Okinawa, right? Then it is interesting. So I tolerate bullshit there mm -hmm. for, you know, the just the nuggets that, that do come out of that. Uh, I, uh, I've only posted there a couple times. Somebody said something about, oh, I lost my, so when you cross the equator, you're no longer a polywog, you're a shellback. That means you've, you, you're, you know, you're not a newbie, you're experienced. So I lost my certificate. What did it look like? I took a picture of my certificate, which is actually hanging in my house, <laughs> and, and put it on there. So through the internet uh, is how I keep, tr keep track of people. Are you a member of any veterans organizations, and if so, which? Nope. Okay. Veterans bug me. <laughs> the people, okay, veterans don't bug me. I'm sure there's people who are veterans that you have no idea that they're veterans because they don't lead with it. Right. And I think you shouldn't. If it's truly service and you did your service, that's it. That's the end of it. If you're doing it because you can get a free meal at Applebee's, you're doing it for the wrong freaking reasons. Uh, if, you, if you're doing it because you get to get on the plane first at the airport, change. Go put on some different clothes, right? Uh, if you're doing it because you get to walk in a parade and people throw candy at you, no, right? So not all veterans are like that, but it occurs to me from my perspective, anytime I've interacted with a formally organized veteran group, they're either A, politicized, which... I don't need, or B, like self-congratulatory or congratulatory seeking, and I'm not interested in any of that. So uh, for the most part, obvious veterans kind of bug the shit out of me. Okay. Um, what else have you done since separating from the military? So you talked about coming back and Exxon yeah. and yeah. you know, finally landing up in the library. Is there anything yeah. else that you've done that you're happy about Saturday? Yeah, no, we're, uh, well, I'm married, been married 27 years. Uh, three kids just, you know, caught the tail end, and I'm under no illusion that it hasn't ended because it has, but I caught the tail end of comfortable middle class. I've decided just to accept it and enjoy it. Uh, I try and limit the amount of complaining I do because I know the next generation is not actively going to have access to the same things I had. So, you know, I like camping. We camp a lot. We're going to be camping for three weeks coming up here soon. Um, I ride a bike. I love riding. Um, we're going to probably pick up fishing because when I retire, we're going to need something to do. <laughs> uh, I don't like fishing now, but I'm going to, I guess I'm going to learn how to fish. Uh, so I volunteer at the bicycle co-op because I like people on bikes, I like bikes, I like, uh, on a bicycle, you're not actually escaping, but it feels like you are, <laughs> right? So uh, I just, I, I like how empowering bikes are. Um, using your own efforts, you actually get measurable results, even if you're just riding around the block, you know? Um, 
I like that once you have a bike, uh, you're self-sufficient. Unlike a car, you have to buy gasoline. You have to have oil changes. You know, you're, you're not trapped. It's not a trap. Maybe it's a trap. Uh, but in a bicycle, you're way more empowered right, than you are uh, limited. Uh, the cost much less. The exercise is fantastic for you. So, so stuff like that. So if I were to be political, I would be like socially political. Like, oh, maybe get a bike. Let me help you get a bike. Oh, maybe check in on your neighbor, you know, stuff like that. So I think if, uh, if uh, I've done um, a lot of research since I've left the military, uh, Smedley Butler, I think, is a, identified it early. I don't know if you know anything about him. He wrote uh, three pamphlets, then the three pamphlets were put together to make a book. It's called War is a Racket. Basically, uh, his perspective was that he was just uh, a thug for commercial business through the US government. So large industry would go to the government and say, oh, we need to sell more bananas from Cuba. Go tell the Cubans we are in charge. And so the Marines would go and squash any organization that was socially trying to be in control of their own natural resource, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I guess if I were to be political, I would consider myself socialist, which is difficult because socialism in general has been villainified uh, because there were groups of people who tried to become actual socialists, but that is a complete affront to a capitalist society. So we say, oh, they're wrong, and here's why, and, you know, uh, but, yeah, so I, I do a lot of reading on economies. Um, I thought we had a shot at Americanized socialism. Uh, through Bernie Sanders. I'm not saying he's perfect. I don't think he's a saint. I think, though, he did represent an opportunity towards something other than just straight, corrupted capitalism. Uh, so that's my political slant. So I've, I've done a lot of research in that area. I don't know if I'm right, but I, I kind of like the idea of, well, if all of our actions are in line with actually being the greatest nation in the world where children don't go to bed hungry, people have access to medical care, you know, nobody has to sleep in the street, then we can call ourselves, you know, the greatest nation in the world. Until then, uh, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And if you have selfish, self-entitled citizens, you get a selfish, self-entitled president. As a veteran, have you ever used your local library? Why or why not? Yes, I love libraries. I do. Libraries are the last bastion of free speech, and libraries give you access to things that you that it's it's you know it's almost socialist, right? Instead of everybody having to buy their own copy of a book, which is very capitalistic, and I'm not saying authors don't have rights. Authors have rights; they do. That is their work. But if a library buys seven copies of something and then everybody gets to share those seven copies, I think that is I think that is fantastic. I think it is you know access for people who are otherwise barred access to things like internet or other avenues of information. Um, before Google, there were reference librarians. There you go. And every time I travel, I make my family stop at that, at wherever we're at, at that local library. And I go in and I talk to the librarians and I embarrass my family and say, I work in a library. Libraries are awesome. I do that. I have pictures of all the libraries I visit. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> As a veteran, are there programs or types of books available at the library that you enjoy more than others? Yes. Uh, Vander Cook wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, introduced me to EMDR, to spatially place uh, traumatic events. And you don't have to be actively engaged in a traumatic event. Just being near a traumatic event is trauma-inducing itself. So if you learn to spatially place, the, that is, you don't erase the event, your body, your mind knows it was the past and this is the present, you can actually be present. So Vandercook, The Body Keeps the Score, uh, I recommend that to anyone, regardless of veteran status. Um, also, um, you know, uh, books on, like, economies, not even just financial things, like this is money, this is how money, not that kind of economy, but like uh, social clout, uh, social capital, you know, are you treating people well? You know, that is a form of social capital. capital. 
capital. Uh, do people perceive you as an otherwise good person? You know, that's a type of an economy, right? So that's the stuff I, uh, I like to, to read about. Um, the things I explicitly don't read, um, uh, and I'm glad our library here specifically doesn't carry them, is like just uh, things that are otherwise brain candy garbage. You know, People magazine, gossip oriented things, I avoid that explicitly. Okay. Unfortunately, it's infiltrating our internets. Okay. As a veteran, is there something that you wish you could change about the library that would enhance your enjoyment of it? What would I change about the library? The place for fun, not the place for work. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would, I would change, and it's political, is just to make sure that funding is defended. That, that libraries are, act, are actively funded. Um, uh, otherwise, yeah, I think uh, each library does what each other library does, and I think that's fantastic. And I think that the, uh, it is a distributed knowledge network rather than a centralized knowledge network, which I think is important because at any time, any one library could have a catastrophic event, but all the other libraries still exist. So I think we just need to make sure that we are actively protecting funding for public libraries. Okay. How did your military or wartime experiences affect your life? Uh, so I went through a, a, like a guilt phase. Um, but again, having uh, been introduced to EMDR specifically and spatially placing things, um, you know, I, I know when things happened. Uh, so, yeah, so I have episodes, even still, of, like, guilt. Um, when you're a kid, and I was a kid, uh, you think everybody's operating in the best interest, so you trust that the decisions being made are the ones that should be made at that time. Then later as an adult, you can kind of get a little different perspective, a little more experience, uh, apply your own personal uh, perspective on things and say, yeah, I may have been a little gullible um, and I may have done some things that otherwise I would not have done. Um, and there's some guilt associated with that. And you just have to reconcile that guilt. Um, I'm glad I did service and I'm ashamed of a lot of the stuff we did. And so that's a dichotomy that you have to be okay with. Uh, it's like a yin and a yang. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, I did my service. And there was times that we actually provided actual honest-to-God service. And there was times that we were probably just strong-arming people for political gain of other people to get ridiculously rich, not even us, right? Um, I'm not saying I won't sell out. I'm just saying that number's really big. Uh, um, so you just have to reconcile that mono-duality where two things happened at the same time. Uh, that, that I was actually providing the service, and some of the things we did were not actually service. But if you can, if you can re allow them both to exist at the same time, then you're, you know, I'm at peace with with that part of my existence. Okay. What are some life lessons you learned from military service? Clean. <laughs> I'm not joking. Clean your stuff. Take care of your stuff. You know, when you're in the middle of the ocean, you can't just be like, deet, 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 deet. Yeah, we need a new thing that, you know, you're going to sink. <laughs> okay? There's nowhere to go. It is a giant ocean. <laughs> so that's the number one thing that stuck with me is just the idea of planned maintenance. If you are fixing things that are broken, you've already failed. Okay? You need to be taking care of them such that your uh, occurrence of failure is much less, right? Maintenance. Uh, so we did plan maintenance in the military, and that stuck with me. It's like everything, and also organization. Um, I am a bit of a minimalist. Unfortunately, I live with four people who are not minimalists. That comes from the military. Uh, when I moved as just an individual person, everything I possessed fit in a giant duffel bag, a briefcase, and a garment bag. Now, it takes... The movers three days to pack everything in two goddamn semi trucks, right? So maybe I got too much stuff. So that that's that's what I've retained from the military. Keep your stuff clean, keep your stuff maintained. 
you do not need a fraction of what you think you need. It's amazing how little we actually need to sur- not to survive, but you know to survive. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, an admiral said this. He was an Arctic explorer. He said, "There's no such thing as bad weather, just bad choices of clothing." <laughs> so, so those are the things that that I remember. Uh, I remember, you know, just take care of your stuff. You, you've already spent money on it. Take care of it. Okay. How has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? So, uh, I se- I separate some things. One, I think all wars are unnecessary. I really do. There is no such thing as a just war. Okay. That's that's an ideal. So the ideal is all wars are unjust. You. You can't say, well, we're just you know, defending ourselves if you have bases in 183 countries, right? Um, so wars, I actually think, are unnecessary. In fact, I think that they're used just as political clout at this point. Um, how I view the service, I actually kind of feel bad for people because we have intentionally crashed our economy such that graduating kids out of high school have two choices, lifelong debt in the form of tuition at a college, or the military. Those are their options. They can't even work at McDonald's anymore because, you know, the uh, replaced with technology. And I'm not saying technology is wrong. What I'm saying is technology should make our lives better. And technology is act being used to make our lives not actually better, right? Makes Or in an oligarchy, better for very few, not better for many, and as such, Many, many people, and I was one of them even in the 80s, the only option uh, as a white trash kid on the west end of Rockford is just go to the military. Um, so I feel bad for people. I think that uh, our military is oversized, I think. Uh, I, I, I think that there are people who are actively putting people in a position that that's their only choice. Mm-hmm. And that's unfortunate. Uh, I can't stop it. Um, so yeah, that's the thing. And then the only other part is I think, again, if it's service, make it mandatory. Make everybody do it, two years. A lot of countries do it. I don't think that's wrong. If you say everybody's got to con- contribute, fine. Let's, let's do it like that. Then let's take away the circle jerk that is going on right now, right? Every football game, they got a giant goddamn flag and all these service members waving the flag they shouldn't that we're here to watch football we're not here for propaganda so we've propagandized uh, military service uh, and it's been exaggerated so if it's actually service we don't we don't talk about it you know you go do your service and then you rejoin society and what you're owed at the end of that well if they baited you with college then take your college if they baited you with other programs then take your programs but like I said before, if, if we're doing it because Applebee's is going to give you a free meal and, and a handshake, then that's not service. That's a circle jerk. Mm-hmm. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear this interview? Thanks for spending this much time. <laughs> uh, it turns out war is not actually necessary. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? And if so, what? Thanks. Uh, What should be added? I don't know. Like I said before, if we if we tried to cover all of it, we the archive wouldn't hold it, right? And and not just me. Like if 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 every single service member was able to convey every single experience, every single feeling, every single you know emotion. Uh, there's no single database that's going to be able to hold that. And I just hope that uh, that there's enough of a collective conscience that the best ideas from veterans, uh, you know, and their attitudes towards things uh, comes out of like that chaos. You know what I mean? Like, so let's take a chaos model and hopefully, uh, and ideally, the best ideas actually kind of filter upwards. Uh, so. I guess, you know, just the collective conscience. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Also, I'm mad at you. You told me I wasn't going to have to cry.
I said you didn't have to cry. Okay. We, we, we always come prepared with Kleenex and water.